you would take your Bible. I know you got your Bible with you this morning. Take your Bible and turn it to Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Amen. When you get there, say amen. 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 I've been hitting on, I know people are kind of wondering what the heck's going on. I've been hitting on a lot of Old Testament and Psalms lately, but, you know, God's been dealing with me in some areas that, that really the church is suffering in and that the, the people of the church are suffering in. And, and it's, it's all about our faith. It's all about our, our love for Christ. And, and it's all about our desire to, to follow Him in the ways that He would have us to follow Him. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, the Old Testament, that's just it. It was the Old Testament. It was before Christ. But, but let me tell you something. I want you to hear me. The blood of Jesus runs all through the Old Testament, whether you realize it or not. The, the blood of Jesus has always been, always will be. It's never going to cease. It'll be there whenever we go to heaven. The blood of Jesus will still be there because Jesus himself will be sitting and his blood will be flowing through him. Amen? Amen. And, his, and because of who he is, his personification of his glory will shine down on us. And we need to be aware that God loves us so much that he would desire for us to all be with him in heaven. Amen? And the only way we're going to do that is through the blood of his son, Amen. is to accept him as Lord and Savior in our life. We have to come to a place in our life that we have to forget about ourselves and accept him for who he is and what he is and what he's done. And when we get to that place, that's when we're going to know true salvation we're going to know that for sure that I know that I know that I know that I'm going to be together with my brothers and sisters in the holy place. Amen? Amen. That's heaven. Amen? That's Zion. That's where we're going to be. Amen? The new Jerusalem. Amen? That's where we're going to be. And that will be, hopefully that will be, the. I'll be able to see everybody there. Amen? Amen. But you know what? It's an individual thing. It's an individual thing. I can't go to heaven because my mom was a saint. Huh? Amen. I'm not going to heaven because the pillars that started this church that are out in the graveyard right now were steadfast in the Lord. I'm not going to heaven for that reason. I'm not going to heaven because I carry my Bible around in the back seat of my car or on the dash of my truck. I'm not going to heaven. The only way to go to heaven is to believe that Jesus, and when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me, Amen. And then he goes on to say, he said, this is what Paul wrote. He said that if thou shalt believe in thy heart, right, Amen. that God raised him from the dead and, and confess with thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. the only way you're going to go to heaven. Amen. I can't get you there. I can't preach you into heaven. I can't preach you out of hell. There's no way I can do that. And make no, I want you to be sure you know there's no doubt in your mind that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we are going to spend eternity in either heaven or in hell. It's that simple. But this morning now, I'm going to get back to the text, okay? And the reason why I said some of this stuff is because some of us are going through some hard times. And I'm going to talk about some hard spots in, the, in our lives that we have to face. You know, I don't care who you are. I, I don't care... But what you say, there are times that we face obstacles and situations that are, that are too big for us to even handle, for us to even comprehend. Those times that we need God's help. Those times that we need to call out His name and call out His name with all kinds of fervence and zeal to have Him hear us and to answer our prayer. Can you imagine going, going about your business and, and one day your life changes dramatically and, and you have to have on your shoulder the responsibility of about two million people. And you're backed up into a situation that there's no human way you could get out of it. This is what happened to Moses, and sometimes we find ourselves in those same hard spots, man. I've been in places where my back was against the wall, amen, where if I jumped, I knew it would be ultimate suicide. I knew there were situations that I just couldn't get out of the corner, man. And I knew it was going to be a bad day. It is there that God wants. But I want you to understand, <clears throat> even though this happened to Moses, 
This is where God wants to show up and teach us life lessons. Amen. Listen, you may be going through a hard time right now. Your back may be against the wall right now. You may be surrounded by circumstances that you can't turn right or left, back or forth. You're in a position where you don't know what to do. But I want you to understand. I want you to hear me. This is when God wants to show up in your life. Amen. Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to apply them this morning? I, I believe that God has spoken to me. That he has spoke to me through Exodus, through Moses. Let's look into Moses' life just a minute and learn from his experiences. Moses tended sheep. He was an old sheep herder. Amen. And he wasn't even his sheep. It was his father-in-law's sheep that he was tending. And he's, he's out one day and he's looking out and all of a sudden he looks on his hillside and he sees this fire on the hillside. And he said, well, that's my dad. That's my dad's land up there. That's my father-in-law's land up there. Who's up there? I'm going to go see what it is. So he sees this this fire, and he gets up close, and he realizes it's just a burning bush. And he, he starts to investigate the bush, and I, I, I'm not mistaken, the Lord said, hold it, wait a minute, Moses. Take your shoes off, because you see, this is holy land. Oh, it wasn't his father-in-law's land anymore. You see, then God had claimed this land is holy land. His very presence was on the hillside, was on that land. And he would not have anything less than perfection to go on to that land. Amen. I want you to understand. I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to get this this morning. Because you're a saint of God, because you're a living son of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because God has anointed you, because He has sanctified you, because He has made you holy, wherever you try becomes holy land. Amen? And we need to give Him glory for that because it's not our land. It's His land. It's kingdom land, y'all. So here we see that Moses goes into the kingdom land. And who should speak out of the bush? Man. You know, sometimes I think we need a burning bush experience in our life. God spoke out of the bush. And the Lord tells Moses that he's going to lead Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. Now, now, don't you think about Moses for just a minute. Moses had fled Egypt. Moses had been 40 years out of Egypt. He was raised 40 years in the ways of Egypt. He was with, he was a, a, a adopted son of the Egyptian Pharaoh. Yeah, right. He hung out with his with his brother, his adopted brother. He hung out with him, who became Pharaoh. So here he is. He, he's he's saying now you're going to go. And he ran because he killed an Egyptian. Amen? Amen. So now the Lord is saying, guess what you're going to do? You're going to lead my people out of the bondage of the Egyptians. And the Lord has, has heard his plight. He said, you know why? Because the Lord, listen, listen, this is where we're missing it. This is where we're missing it, y'all. Do you know why Moses was going back? It wasn't just because God said you were going back. He said God had heard the prayer of his people. Amen. He'd heard the cries of his people. He had finally opened his ears, Brother John. He had turned back to his people. He heard the cry. He couldn't stand it anymore. He, those cries were just ringing in his ears to the point he said, I've got to get my people back. I want you to hear me this morning. God is still crying out to his people. He's still crying out, I want my people back. Yeah. Somebody's got to carry them out of the bondage of sin. Somebody's got to carry them out of the out of the out of the slavery that they're in from the bondage of sin. Amen. I need people to come out. I need you to go. I want you to go speak for my people. Are you getting this? God don't want just Moses to do it anymore because he's called us to be priests. Amen. That's what he wants us to do. So here we see that, here we see that he says, you're going to go, you're going to go let my people free. And after a series of power struggles between Moses and God, hey look, they had a conversation. Do you know how many times I've told God I wasn't supposed to preach? Do you know how many conversations we had about preaching? I mean, it was almost like to a point where you've got to be kidding me. You really don't want me to do this, Lord. You go on and do this. No, no, I'm going to cut the grass. I'm going to do some visitation. I'll do some 
temptation. I'll do that. I'm okay with that. I, I can do that. Okay, Lord, I'll teach a Sunday school class. I can do that. Okay, Lord, I'll need Bible study on Sunday night. I can do that. But I'm not preaching. Okay, Lord, I'm going this one time to preach this message. But I'm done after that. I look like I'm done. Amen. <laughs> so after these power struggles that God, you know who wins every time? God wins. I don't care. Amen. I don't care. He wins every time. Moses goes to Pharaoh and demands the, the release of his people. And things just ain't going too well for that. Amen? You know, Pharaoh's kind of hard-headed. He kind of reminds me of Ricky. He's kind of stubborn. He don't want to give up and give in. He likes what he's got. Amen? So, and, and, you know, we do too. We all do. Amen? So, so here we say, I'm picking at Ricky now. Ricky's probably the most humble guy in the, amen, to a point. Until you push his button. Amen. But anyway, <laughs> I'll talk to you Ricky when we get through. I apologize. <laughs> so anyway, Pharaoh. Okay. <laughs> Pharaoh is not impressed and makes it harder on the Israelites. You know, he starts taking away straw. He starts making it harder for them to make brick. He starts doing all that stuff. And in chapter six, God promises to deliver deliverance after Moses cries out to God. You know, finally Moses got to a place where. He just said, what the heck is going on here, Lord? You sent me over here to free these people, and now all of a sudden, you're not doing anything. And he, he, he cried out to him. He said, oh, Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble unto this people, and you have not rescued your people. He's saying, what are you doing, God? You send me out here. You make me stir up a hornet's nest, and now you don't want to put no spray on it and put it, kill them. Why did you do this? Well, Moses battles the magicians. Y'all know the story. He battles the magicians of Pharaoh. You know, he took his rod. The, 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 the magicians come out, and they make snakes appear into the thing. And Moses lays his rod down, and it becomes a snake, and he's their snakes. Amen? Well, we know that was one battle, but he had many battles with the magicians, and, and he won the battle. Amen? So here we see that, that he, Moses and the magicians have many battles. God shows his power by sending numerous plagues to Egypt. Amen. Until one night in chapter 12 of Exodus, it's where verse 31, it says, During the night Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and your Israelites. He said, Wow, I've had enough. He said, go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and, her and herds as you have said and go and bless me. He said, get out of here. And after all the plagues, the loss of faith. Now, now, now think about it. The final plague was where they, the firstborn of every male, firstborn male of every house was taken. Okay? And Pharaoh's son was taken. Okay? So so the loss of Pharaoh's firstborn, he, he had he had enough. He had all he could take. He said, get out of my country. Go worship your God. Take all your stuff and get out of here, man. I don't even want to see you anymore. You know, I've had some people tell me that before. But it's kind of a different sacred circumstance. You know what I mean? I'm sick of you, dude. Get out of here. Amen? Well, I got to take this junk and get out of here. You know? Short time later, he has a second thought, you know? It said that in the scriptures, it says that God softened his heart. Amen. Through the death of his son, God softened his Pharaoh's heart. Okay? And that's when he released the people. But then later on, as the people are exiting, as the people are getting out of, out of Egypt, it says his heart became hardened. It didn't say God hardened his heart. It said his heart became hardened. He hardened his own heart. His flesh hardened his heart. And he started chasing after the Israelites. He starts going after them. And they're, they're, now here they are. He's chasing them. And, and they think, the Israelites think everything's okay. Everything's good. Then all of a sudden they see this deal going on where they see this cloud of dust. And it's the Pharaoh's people that are coming after him. You know, a short time later, he had a second thought and realized that he just, he, he, he released over two million slaves. So he said, you know what? I, I'm going back. I'm going to go get them. 
And then in Exodus 13, 17 says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God didn't lead them on the road through the Philistine country. He took them another way. He, threw, he took them, uh, though the, the Philistine country was shorter, he took them another way. He said, for God said, if, thy face, if thy, they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road towards the Red Sea. Okay, so they didn't take the shortcut. God led them another way. He took them to the Red Sea. Now, the Israelites realized what was going on. They were running for their life to get where God had promised them. And they are, they're faced by obstacles all on, on all sides. And Anyone know what I'm talking about this morning when you're facing those obstacles on all, <clears throat> obstacles on all sides? And, you know, those times that we're trying to do what is right. Have you ever tried to do something right and just kept looking like it was going to be against you? Have, have you ever been in a position where you stood up for something that you knew was right that was going to cost you dearly? Yes, sir. So here we see that they're trying to do something, you know, those times when we try to do something right, those times trying to do what we believe the Lord has told us to do, those times that our faith is strained to the max, you know, and the enemy seems to be pursuing us and, and we have no place to go. Those times we, we have no answers. Times we have no human alternatives. You know, we're kind of between the rock and a hard place. The times when we have to choose between two unsatisfactory options. I'm going to tell you something, y'all. We're in the middle of that right now. We're right in the middle of that right now. Amen. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I wouldn't vote for neither one of these people that are running for presidency right now if I had an option. Yeah. And I ain't got no option. Amen? I'd just be right up front with you because I'm in my eyes, in my opinion, neither one of them stand for Christ. Neither one of them. That's right. Somebody said, well, you vote the lesser of the two evils. Figure it out. Figure it out. Amen? And I'm not going there. I'm just saying. That's up to you to figure out. Amen? It's bad when the pastor can't even say, well, you know, you need to, I ain't. Amen? So anyway, anyway, that was free. I'm going to give you some other phrases of unsatisfactory choices. You know, between the evil and the deep blue sea, that's a, one of them. A, an offer you can't refuse. Catch 22. Back to the drawing board. Doom and gloom. Face the music. If you can't stay in the heat, yeah. get out of the kitchen. The problem is they can't stand the heat and can't get out of the kitchen. So with that said, I'm going to ask Brother Ricky, would you stand and read Exodus Chapter 14, 10 through 14 for me. <clears throat> We've got, hey, y'all, we got to the text. Amen. We're there. Um, chapter 14, 10, 10 through 14. All right. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. <laughs> so they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Because their were no graves in Egypt. Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you, why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? This is not the word that we were told in Egypt. Egypt saying, "Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians." For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die, that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And the Lord will fight for you, and he shall hold your peace. Amen. May God bless the reading of his holy word this morning. Have you ever found yourself in a predicament up against the wall? You know, some of us have... Some of us this morning may be right there, right now. That may be going on right now. 
The Israelites found themselves between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. That ain't a good position to be in. That's a, that's a no-win circumstance. So, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. It may just be the spot that the Lord has to bring you to, though. You ever thought about that? So that He can accomplish what He needs to accomplish in your life. You know, I've been caught between a rock and a hard place several times in my life. Sometimes that I just didn't see any way to get out of it. <clears throat> and, and it never failed. Every time that I tried to get out of it, it was become a bigger trap. It became a, a, a more <laughs> harder place to get out of. So, so we see that sometimes we put ourselves in positions that, or we think we put ourselves in positions, but it might not be us doing it. It might be God waiting to see if we're going to be faithful and wait for Him. Amen? <coughs> so here we see that they're between the Pharaoh and the, and the, and the Red Sea. I'll give you a little illustration this morning of the situation. It says a, a little boy was leading his sister up a mountain path and and the way was not easy. It was hard for them to walk. It was hard for them to get up the mountain path. And why, this isn't a, a path at all, the little girl complained. And it's all rocky and bumpy. And her little brother kept up the, the mountainside. And he pausing, he looked back, and he just, just long enough to call out. He said, sure, but the bumps are what you climb on. You see, sometimes... What we think is a bad position is a place that God put us in so that we can get through it. Amen? Sometimes the very thing that we see as an obstacle are the things that the Lord allows in our life as a stepping stone to get us out of the situation that we're in. I'm going to say it one more time. Sometimes the very thing we see as an obstacle are the things that the Lord allows in our life as a stepping stone to get us out of the situation that we're in. Amen? The fact of the matter is that just because you name the name of Jesus doesn't exempt you from the challenges of life. Amen? Amen. Listen, you're going to have challenges. <coughs> we will all face times of pressure and times of exhaustion and times we don't know what we will do. Amen? Amen. I, I was thinking about it last night. I asked my wife when we were, you know, we were so full of chili. Amen? <laughs> You know, there was 10 kinds of chili there yesterday. 10 different types of chili. You ever tried to eat 10 different types of chili? <laughs> Amen. I don't know about the commercial plot, plot, fizz, fizz, but I was needing some kind of relief. Amen. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, I asked her, but it's getting kind of late, and we didn't want no supper. But I did want something. I said, you want some popcorn? She said, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take some popcorn. So... But I want you to think about popcorn for just a minute. Popcorn's just kernels, right? It don't become popcorn until it gets put in fire. Put under some pressure before it becomes what it is intended to be. You know what? We're a lot like popcorn as Christians. Sometimes we have to get put under the fire. Sometimes we have to get the pressure on us before we can call out the name of Jesus. Amen. Sometimes we have to pop out and accept Jesus for what he is and what he's going to do. Sometimes we have to become, you know, God is waiting for us to really pop and become fully what we're supposed to be for him. Amen. Just like popcorn is supposed to be popcorn, we're supposed to be true Christians too. Amen. And sometimes you might get put under a little heat, get up, put under a little pressure, so that he can see the Christian you can be. Amen? So we see that this morning you might be right there. Feeling like no escape, no help, nowhere to turn, and it may be right where God wants you to be this morning. What are you going to do with this this morning? The Lord sees where you are and at this time, and he can also see you where you can be with his help. Amen? He, he don't want you to do it alone. He don't want you to do it by yourself. God shows up in his timing, not in ours. That's something I, I have a hard time with. You know, somebody, I don't know who it was, was talking yesterday, they were talking about patience. 
I don't know who it was. I, I can't remember who it was. We were talking about Paige. Might have been this morning. It was this morning. It was Connie this morning. She was talking about Paige. Hey, Connie. Hey, Connie. <laughs> I called call her out, didn't I? <laughs> it was Connie this morning. She was talking about patience with her eyes. And she said, she asked the doctor. She said, do you have a prescription that I could get filled for patience? Amen. <laughs> I told, and I said instantly said, if I could get a prescription, if I could figure out how to do that, I'd make, I'd be rich. I'd make a fortune. Because there's a bunch of impatient people. Not me. Not me. I'm very patient. Amen. I was real patient yesterday up to the four-way tie. No, let's don't get started back on that again. I was real patient yesterday, and we need to be patient every day. Amen. So, so. If we could just get to a place where we could wait for God. Wait for Him to show up, Bobby. Amen. Wait for Him to show up in our lives because when He shows up, He shows out. Amen. You know, I've never seen anything come to surface and come right straight where it should be until I get to the place where I can just get, you know, finally just submit and say, okay, God, I'm going to wait on you. And He said, well... Finally, it's about time. I got it through that head of yours. I got it through that Billy Goat button head of yours. That if you'll wait on me, I'll make it right. And when he does, it is perfect every time. Not sometimes, but every time. He shows up in his time. God is never early and he is never late. I can remember when Jesus went to see about Lazarus, said he was four days getting to him. And if you'll know the old to a Jewish tradition that old Jewish thoughts was that if he had gotten there three days, the whole the spirit of uh, Lazarus had an opportunity to go back in the body, but because he had waited four days, it was too late, and that man was dead and would never rise again. But I want to tell you, Jesus can be four days late and be right on time every time. Because if you think about it, when he got there, he said, Mo he said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. And he jumped up out of that grave. Amen? Amen. God's timing is perfect. God is never early and he's never late. Let me tell you something. He is right on time and we, if we'll just let him. The problem with Israel was simple. They forgot God. They forgot that God had brought them to that point. They forgot that when God makes a promise that it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. Amen? Sometimes your circumstances had, has to play out according to God's plan for your life. You know, we try to fix it, we try to hurry it, and we try to change it. But sometimes we need to do a little math. We need to do Jesus plus nothing equals change circumstance. If we'll do that, we'll see the work of God come forth. Amen? The Red Sea for Israel served a purpose. The purpose was to let them know that they couldn't do it alone. The text I just read, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Egyptians didn't corner the Israelites, y'all. Listen to me. The Egyptians didn't corner the Israelites. God led them to the Red Sea so that he could provide for his people at the right time. God had a purpose to bring them to the Red Sea. It, it didn't happen by chance. It wasn't a coincidence. It was divine moment where God was in control when it didn't look like it by us, amen, because we always think it should be a different way, or by the, by the Israelites. I can honestly say when I read this story, when I first time I ever read this story, I said, why in the world would they go someplace like that knowing they're going to be pinned? I thought that anybody with any common sense would know not to do that. Well, our God has a different thought process than we do. Amen? The Red Sea for you this morning serves a purpose. It may be to glorify God. It may be to draw you closer to God. It may be to get something in or out of your life this morning, but you're backed up to the Red Sea for a purpose. It's not by accident that you're where you're at. It's done on purpose. So I said, well, good grief, Lord. You would do this to me? Scripture says, but I will glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army 
and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God may use you to get the attention of your enemy, to realize that God is in control. You, you may be right where God wants you, doing exactly what God wants you to do. Now, now I want you to understand that when you accepted Christ, listen now, listen to me, when you accepted Christ, that you gave Him permission to use you as He sees fit. Amen? Now see, that's a hard pill for us to swallow. Sometimes. It really is. Because you see, you gave away your freedom. Amen? And he, blocked, he owns you. You don't own him. He owns you. Maybe if you haven't realized it yet, God's plan is not executed the way that you would have it done. Is it? Is it? Because he will show us and others that he is God and we ain't. It's that simple. God's plan is not logical by human standards. I've come to realize that. Why would I even try? I might as well, when it, I hate to say this, but when it comes to God's ways, I just throw common sense of man out the window. He says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Preaching of, preaching of the cross is to them, listen, this is what the scripture says, preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. God didn't intend for the Israelites to die in the desert or to be drowned in the Red Sea. He didn't want his plan at all. Amen? He intended to do what he wanted done, what he intended to do, and that was to take them to the promised land. Listen, when we're in that hard spot, we assume the worst. And sometimes we go to places in our mind that we shouldn't go. Amen? The Israelites thought that the Egyptians were coming to kill them in the desert. They didn't want to kill them. Listen, that wasn't the plan at all. They weren't going to kill them. Now, some of them would have perished probably, but that wasn't their plan. They wanted to bring them back and make them slaves again. You see, Pharaoh said, wait a minute. You know, he really thought about it. He used his common sense. He said, wait a minute. Who's going to do the work? <clears throat> huh? Who's going to do the work? They assumed they were going to be killed. The Israelites backed up against the Red Sea assumed that God intended to have them killed or drowned trying to escape. He wanted to release them from their bondage. That's what his whole plan was. Amen? God's perspective, which is the only one that counts, is that he didn't intend for anything to happen to them but was going to provide deliverance. Oh, wait a minute. He was going to provide deliverance and keep his promise to his people. Do you know that God... Hasn't changed one iota. Amen. He's still the same today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. He's never changing. And do you know to that point, he still offers deliverance to his people? In the Old Testament, he delivered his people. In the New Testament, he delivered his people. In the scriptures, in the, Paul wrote time and time again, he delivered them from the bondage of sin. He delivered them out of prison. He delivered them from death. He delivered them from being stoned. He delivered them time and time again. And I want to tell you this morning that God is still in the deliverance business. He can deliver you from your bondage and your finances. He can deliver you from your, your pathological mind, what's going on in your life. He can deliver that you from that. He can deliver you from anything that's going on in your life if you will just submit and allow Him to do it. Amen? Amen. And believe by faith Amen. that God is the great deliverer. <laughs> Because he is. And he keeps his promise. He don't go back on his word. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He made that promise 2,000 years ago and it still stands true today. He'll never leave you. Amen. And he'll never forsake you. Hmm. He's going to keep his promise to his people. He meant it. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid is what God said. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Amen? Amen. Yeah. The Lord will fight for you. Huh? He said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's right. He said, today, he said, Stand. He told, what's it, Jehoshaphat? Was it Jehoshaphat, Brother John, that he told to stand? 
You're not sure me either. I'm saying you close with that. Somebody may straighten me out on this. But he told them to stand and wait for the battle is mine, saith the Lord. Mm. Y'all get me straight on that now. Somebody else, some of you Bible scholars, get me straight. I thank you straight. <laughs> I thank you straight. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> no. Mm. Sometimes you just need to get still. He'll fight for you if you just get still. Remember today if you're Facing the Red Sea experience. It only seems impossible to you. But all things are impossible in Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Nothing's impossible with God. All things are possible with God. It only seems impossible, but it's not. Confidence that God will do what He has promised, you know. I'll give you another illustration. They say... Confidence is going. This is pretty cool. I thought it was pretty funny anyway. You know what confidence really is? Confidence is going after Moby Dick in a whaleboat with a bottle of tartar sauce. Amen. Amen. That's confidence. Amen. You know you're going to have you a fish dinner. Amen. Right, in a rowboat with a harpoon and a bottle of tartar sauce. That means you've got plan to believe that God's going to do what God says He's going to do in your life. That's pretty cocky, I'd have to say. Hey, boys, get in the car, the tartar sauce, drop the boat, we're going. <laughs> we're going, we're going fishing. Now, we know that didn't turn out too well, amen? <laughs> if you read the book, and I had to read the book, amen? In high school, I had to read the book. Brother John, you and Miss Joyce come up. Well, so here it is for you this morning. This may be for you this morning. When you're up against the hard spots, the Red Sea experiences, I want you to remember this. The first thing I want you to remember is that God's plan will not be executed the way you think it should. I'm going to read it again. God's plan won't be executed the way you think it should. The second thing is His plan is not logical by human standards. The, I want you to understand. I, I wrestled all week with this message. I almost got a message out of Gideon. I, I was going to preach a message, and I probably will before it's over with it. But even with Gideon, he started out with 32,000 men, and God got them down to 300 to accomplish his task. He didn't need all that. Yeah, that's right. And to show everyone that it is a God thing, a God moment. It is not logical, but it is God. Little story. This is between a conversation between a surgeon and an eight-year-old. And the surgeon starts off, he said, tomorrow morning I'll, he's a cardiologist, tomorrow morning I'll open up your heart, and the surgeon said to the, said to the eight-year-old boy, the eight-year-old boy immediately responded, he said, you'll find Jesus there. The surgeon continued, I'll open your heart and check the damage. The boy said, you're going to find Jesus in there. When I see the damage, I'll suture you back up and then think about the next step. You will find Jesus in my heart because my Sunday school teacher told me so. She said it says it so in the Bible. Besides that, our Sunday school song says that he lives there. That's what the little boy said. The surgery took place the next day. The surgery took place the next day. After the surgery, the surgeon began to make notes of what he found. In his mind, there was no hope and no cure. The little boy would die within a matter of months. And 
They thought began to get to the doctor, and all of a sudden the doctor shouted to God, Have you ever wanted to do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this to this little boy? Why can't he live a normal life? God speaks out of the quietness. He spoke to his heart. He said, this boy is a part of my flock and will always be a part of my flock. When he is with me, there will be no more pain and suffering. He will be comfort. He will, he will have comfort and peace. One day, his parents, as well as you, will join him and my flock will continue to grow. The next day, the surgeon went to the boy's room and sat down with the parents beside the bed. In a few minutes, the little boy opened his eyes and asked very quietly, what did you find in my heart? The surgeon had tears running down his face. He said, I found Jesus there. Amen. You see, between the rock and the hard place is Jesus. And it's really a good place to be. Amen. We're going to sing a song this morning. Page 294. Have that on the way. <coughs> you know, I don't know your circumstance. I don't know what you got going on in your life. I, I just know that Jesus wants to be a part of it. I, I know that Jesus wants to help you through your time. When your back's against the Red Sea and the enemy's in front of you, God wants to help you get through that circumstance. Here's the key to it all. I want you to think about the more of the story, what happened at the Red Sea. Even Moses was kind of going, huh? You know? But let me tell you what God did in that moment when, when the people really started to doubt him what was going on, and Pharaoh started closing in on them, getting closer and closer and closer, and the enemy was just coming up closer and closer and closer. He put a wall of fire between Pharaoh and his people. Then he told Moses to raise his rod, raise his staff towards the Red Sea. <coughs> So, if Moses hadn't have done that now, if Moses hadn't have done what God told him to do, I don't know how long the pillar of fire, I don't know how long the wall of fire would have stayed there. I don't know what the next circumstance would be, but here's the key to it all, is that Moses turned and did exactly what God told him to do. He was obedient. It didn't make any... It, it didn't... It, he couldn't comprehend it. Now look, if I'd have been Moses, common sense would have told me this is the stupidest thing to try to do that I've ever heard of in my life. But Moses realized that it wasn't a human thing, that it was a God thing. The pillar of fire was evidence that God was supposed to do something miraculous. <laughs> so Moses turned with his rod and held it up, and what happened? The sea parted. God may be telling you this morning to stand. Hold up your staff this morning. Your staff may be your right hand of praise and glory to Him this morning. He may be telling you that you need to come to Him and Him alone this morning. This is your time. <coughs> this is your opportunity. It may not be another time. Today's the day. We don't know what's going to happen. God could say, you know, uh, they may think they have an election on the 8th of November, but I may be, I might just come on and get this thing over with. Amen. And the right body. Amen. 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 The problem is, is or the situation is, are you prepared? Right. Are you ready? If God said, if God said, son, go get my children, would you be ready? 